a farmer goes out to sow. Some of the seeds fall on, and I bet even as you heard the gospel read, you knew what would be said next. As this farmer sowed the seed, some of it landed on the path. Some landed on rocky soil. Some landed among the thorns, but some, some of it landed on good soil, where it produced great fruit. Like me, you've probably heard plenty of reflections about this scripture, often with a focus on, well, are we like good soil or not? At this time in our history, I'd suggest the more important question is, are we like that farmer or not? You see, I think most farmers, you know, would be less wasteful than that. They'd, they'd put the seeds right where it had the best chance to grow. You know, seeds are expensive, and they didn't want to waste this precious resource. But not this farmer. He takes the seed and throws it everywhere. I mean, how reckless. He's not just extravagant. He's actually wasteful. Planting in seeds where it just had no chance of growing. So, back to the question. Are we like that wasteful farmer or not? Me, I was sure trained not to be like that. Growing up, one of the mantras in the Kempf household was, don't waste that. You know, if we put a good amount of food on our plates... You better eat all of that. Don't waste that. Or when mom would serve the dreaded lima beans because they are good for us, we had to eat them. There are people starving in Africa. Don't waste that. Or hand-me-down clothes. There's still plenty of good in those jeans. Don't waste them. And and there's a certain wisdom to this type of upbringing. Many have learned how not to waste our time on things that don't matter, waste our money on things we don't need, or waste the precious resources of the earth itself. We rightly don't want to be wasteful. But I've got to unlearn that when it comes to the things that my hero, Jesus, values, you know, compassion, kindness, forgiveness, humble service, love. When it comes to those things that Jesus thought so important, I've got to learn to become wasteful with those. So do you. We all do. You see, my friends, this wasteful farmer that Jesus describes today is God. Jesus taught us by his words and showed us by his life that God recklessly scatters love everywhere. Jesus did not die only for those he thought would appreciate it. God doesn't only the love those from whom he thinks God thinks the odds of a positive response are good. God doesn't decide to love and care only where is, there's the least risk of failure. No, God, it's extravagant. I mean, think about even Jesus at the Last Supper when he gave communion to his disciples. Did he not even give communion to Judas, knowing he was about to betray him? That's probably worth thinking about sometime. And the question is, can we learn more and more to love like that? Can we be kind and fair to people who are not kind and fair to us? Can we 
be loving to those who don't even like us? Can we serve in areas well, where we're probably never going to see the results we dreamed of? In other words, can we live from the inside out, deciding that that's how we want to be, regardless of the results? Not that we don't care about them, but not make our behavior and thoughts dependent upon them. Mother Teresa had a sign on the wall of her home for children in Calcutta, which includes, among others, these four guiding principles. One, if you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. Two, people are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Love them anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. And the good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. And why? I mean, why would we live like this? I mean, yes, Jesus clearly commanded it. He said, love one another as I have loved you. That's exactly how he has loved us. But again, but why? Beyond that, because of the joy that it brings. Jesus would tell us it is so worth it. I mean, this is the way he lived, and it is the path to happiness, this non-calculating, non-results-driven kind of loving is precisely the means, the path to a meaningful and joy-filled life. It's so worth it. And it's not easy. I mean, it can be so discouraging, right, to, to care for people who judge our motives. I mean, we pour out our lives for people who don't appreciate it. We serve in situations that are doomed to failure, but we do it anyway. Let me tell you of two of my heroes in this regard. One is the Jesuit priest, Gregory Boyle, who works in Los Angeles, helping young folks extricate themselves from the gangs they can be a part of. Now, I, I think that each chapter of his fantastic book, Tattoos on the Heart, made me both cry and laugh, sometimes at the same time. And at a conference at which he was speaking, a woman asked him, well, how do you handle the many setbacks and dis disappointments, all the discouragement? I watched as he thought for a second, and then he looked up and said, we have to love being loving. That's it. I think that's exactly it. To love being loving. I think this was in our hearts from the beginning, but we can learn it again. We can learn to again to love being loving regardless of the outcome. Let me end with the story of another of my heroes. A few of you have heard me here heard me speak of Ted Molitor before, but if so, please bear with me. Some years ago, I led the funeral services for Ted's younger brother, Artie. Artie, who died at age 61, had Down syndrome and had lived at home with Ted. Ted was a kind and gentle man who, in addition to his work as a teacher, took care of his aged, widowed mom until she died, and then did the same thing with his brother, Artie. A few weeks after the funeral, I saw Ted in the back of church, and I said, Ted, what's it like to be you now that you've buried your brother, Artie? 
he moved me deeply with his answer. He said, I'm just so grateful, Father. He said, you, need, you see, Artie needed me. There was no one else to care for him. And then he started crying and said, for years, my prayer has been just that I would live at least one day longer than Artie, and I'm so grateful that I did. And when the time of Ted's own death comes, I believe that Ted will have a deep inner peace. And when he moves from this life into the life beyond what we can see, that it will feel so much like home for him because it's the love he's already known here. He already has a taste of the goodness, the peace, and the joy in the heart of God now because he has learned to love being loving. To all of you who work at loving like this, thank you. To all who live in solidarity with the underdog, with the lost and the lowly, thank you. To all who serve when no one notices, to all who care for this planet, who work for justice, who work for peace, who pour yourself out for goals you'll never see fully realized in your lifetime, thank you. You know, in the end, it's worth it, isn't it? This deep inner peace that comes from being like our God. God who loves being loving.